October 4th of 2018, the first total of four Star Trek shorts were released exclusively on CBS All Access. One will be dropped each month until the release of Season 2 of Star Trek Discovery in January of 2019. Officially, these shorts are meant to expand the Star Trek Discovery universe, to keep fans yearning for more Discovery satiated until the release of Season 2, and to drive more subscriptions to CBS All Access. Unofficially though, these shorts represent a very expensive failed experiment, which has only served to confirm to the powers that be at CBS that no matter how much they posture in the media, the number of viewers who actually enjoy Star Trek Discovery is a far smaller one than they would have liked. Indications are that Discovery may be the least viewed Star Trek series of all time. That has only added to the behind the scenes issues associated with Star Trek Discovery, a production that lost its corporate guardian angel when former CBS head honcho and Discovery progenitor Leslie Moonves was fired in disgrace. In this video, we will cover the popularity of Star Trek Discovery and why the Star Trek shorts paint such a bleak picture of it. Then, we'll explore the firing of Les Moonves and what repercussions that might have for not just the future of Star Trek Discovery, but for the future of Star Trek, period. As we covered in our previous video devoted to Star Trek Discovery and the Picard Revival series, Star Trek Discovery was greenlit only as a means to drive subscribers to the streaming service CBS All Access. While it was a very expensive series to make, it represented no risk to CBS, as Netflix paid so much for the international distribution rights that they effectively paid the full cost of producing the first season. But despite news headlines proclaiming Star Trek Discovery a worldwide hit and a cultural phenomenon, Netflix were anything but happy with how Star Trek Discovery performed or how it was received by their subscribers. Relative to what they paid for it, Season 1 did not live up to anywhere near their expectations. Netflix made it abundantly clear to CBS that unless they were given a considerable reduction in price, they would not be paying for Season 2. This meant that unlike Season 1, CBS would have to foot a very sizable chunk of the cost of making Season 2 themselves. That shouldn't have been so bad. Season 1 was essentially a free lunch, one which did serve to promote CBS All Access to the masses, and with the expected massive surge in the subscriber base and subsequent growth in revenue from All Access, CBS should have had no problems making up for the shortfall of giving Netflix such heavy discounts. That's should have had in the past never tense. As it turned out, the actual surge in CBS All Access subscriptions was nowhere near what it was projected to be. On the contrary, Star Trek Discovery hadn't worked out much better for CBS All Access than it had for Netflix. CBS does not publicize up-to-date information on how many subscribers their streaming services have, let alone the actual viewership data. But on a couple of occasions, they have revealed how many subscribers they had at those times. And from that, data can be extrapolated, which End Screen Media's Colin Dixon did for the Video Inc. Based on actual data made public by Les Moonves himself, such as CBS All Access having about 2 million subscribers as of late January of 2018, Dixon was able to use that and other official figures to calculate that between July of 2016 and February of 2017, CBS All Access grew by an average of 70,000 subscribers per month, but that was before the release of Star Trek Discovery. Between March of 2017 and January of 2018, the time frame which included all but the final two episodes of Discovery's first season, All Access only grew by an average of 40,000 subscribers per month, a growth of an average of 30,000 less than before Discovery was released. This might serve to explain why there were so many fire sales on CBS All Access in the weeks and months following the release of Star Trek Discovery. Dixon extrapolated the numbers further. He estimated the total viewership numbers for Star Trek Discovery was a maximum of 780,000 viewers per episode. If his calculations are even in the ballpark, that would, by a substantial margin, make Star Trek Discovery the least watched Star Trek series of all time, bar none, with viewership numbers that would be mediocre even by CW standards. By contrast, Star Trek Enterprise had a Nielsen rating of 2.5 when it was canceled back in the very different market of 2005. The man who made that decision was none other than Les Moonves himself. By modern standards, a 2.5 rating translates to good numbers, which would have guaranteed renewal, and which Discovery could only dream about. CBS has an express goal of 4 million subscribers to CBS All Access by 2020. According to Dixon's calculations, they are not on track to reach it. That, combined with Netflix no longer picking up the bill for Star Trek Discovery, a costly lack of interest from licensees, and an angry fandom 
made even more angry by significant and unpopular story points having leaked online meant that the higher-ups at CBS decided a course correction was urgently needed. Changes were mandated while the last episodes of Season 1 were still in production, which meant that they were partially rewritten and reshot to signal a new direction from Season 2 onwards. The original plan for Star Trek Discovery was to focus only on the Starship Discovery, Michael Burnham, and the key supporting cast. Since the series takes place a decade before the original series in what producers insist is the prime timeline, then the original Enterprise is out there somewhere in the ether, and both Captain Christopher Pike and Spock should be on it. We weren't going to see them, though. While a reference to the Enterprise was not off the table years down the line, when Discovery eventually would approach the timeline of the original series, writer and producer Akiva Goldsman was, as of October 2017, adamant that Spock would never appear on screen in Star Trek Discovery, which was its own thing. But that was before CBS deemed the original direction to have been a failure. Much like when Warner Brothers executives demanded Batman be brought in to save the day when Man of Steel underperformed, CBS executives reportedly demanded the Enterprise and familiar faces associated with it be brought in to save the day when Discovery underperformed. The original ending that was filmed for Season 1 reportedly featured Mira Georgiou recruited to Starfleet's clandestine operation Section 31, which was to have been a major storyline in Season 2. That storyline could very well still happen in some form, but that scene had to make way for an appearance by the original Enterprise, in a redesigned form that is. According to designers John Eves and Scott Schneider, the Enterprise, as shown in Discovery, was required to be 25% different from the original Enterprise for copyright reasons, and three times larger in order to fit in with the usual ship sizes of this universe, a universe that the producers somehow still proclaim to be prime. We have covered these copyright issues before, but we'll explore them in far greater detail in an upcoming video devoted to the rights issues. But let's get back to Season 2 of Star Trek Discovery. While the series' focus would still be on Burnham and the Discovery, it would attempt to win viewers back by bringing in the Enterprise, Pike, Number One, and Spock, and build up to the cage, the original Star Trek pilot which was rejected by NBC and featured all these elements. These and other CBS-mandated changes, though, are alleged to have contributed to the already high tension in the writers' room increasing further. On June 14th, The Hollywood Reporter broke the scoop that showrunners Aaron Harberts and Gretchen Berg had been fired from Season 2 of Star Trek Discovery midway through its production. According to the publication, they were fired in part for being abusive to the writing staff, but much more importantly, for going way over budget on the first few episodes, meaning later episodes would have to be scaled back to compensate. Since then, leaks emanating from the production have painted a more detailed picture. These leaks suggest that contrary to the impression one could get from the initial news article revealing that Harberts and Berger had been fired, they hadn't blown the budget by going way overboard on the stories the first time around. Instead, very early rough cuts of the first five episodes as they were initially filmed had tested so poorly in internal test screenings that rewrites and reshoots were ordered. This is what caused the cost of those first five episodes to skyrocket, which also meant that less money would be available for the remaining episodes of the season. The one appointed to oversee the rewrites and reshoots was Alex Kurtzman, who would also officially serve as showrunner from Episode 6 onward. We do not know the full details of what was changed in the reshoots, but the leaks suggest that Pike's extremist Catholic faith and penchant for praying before every major decision was toned down, and that it was in these reshoots that the Klingons got hair. As you will recall, the Klingons in Season 1, just like those in the Kelvin Timeline movies, were hairless. In Star Trek Las Vegas of 2017, Discovery creature designers Neville Page and Glenn Hedrick told audiences that the Klingons being hairless was a mandate from original showrunner Brian Fuller, and that it was meant to heighten their senses, as their ridges contained sensors, meaning these Klingons were genetically hairless. Fans were loud and clear in how much they disapproved of the Klingons in Season 1, so much so that CBS heard them. They were slightly redesigned even for the initial Season 2 shoot, and then hair was added in the reshoots. This brought them much closer to the more traditional design seen from the motion picture up to the Next Generation era. Rather than admitting that fan outrage may have had something to do with the change, the retroactive explanation is that Klingons always had hair and they only shaved it in times of war. However inconsistent that is, not only with previous canon, but what we've already seen in Star Trek Discovery. But continuity issues aside, the biggest problem with the reshoots was the cost they came in at, 
The rising costs on the already very expensive series, combined with the extreme discounts given to Netflix and CBS All Access falling short of the projected subscription base and therefore earnings, meant that management had to find another way to generate revenue from Star Trek Discovery. What they came up with were the shorts. On September 20th, CBS announced four Star Trek short stories which they had dubbed Short Treks. These four shorts, Runaway, centering on Ensign Tilly, played by Mary Weissman, Calypso, featuring a new character named Kraft, played by Aldous Hodge, The Brightest Star, centering on Saru, played by Doug Jones, and The Escape Artist, featuring Harry Mudd, played by Rain Wilson, would be released on a cycle of one per month between October and January exclusively on CBS All Access. In the official press release, this was hyped as the Star Trek franchise expanding on CBS All Access. Rumors emanating from the production, however, suggest a far bleaker story. Allegedly, the only motivation for making the shorts in the first place was to sell them to international distributors, most notably Netflix, at an additional cost, to bring in some much-needed extra cash into the production. The shorts were conceived and written around the availability of the cast and sets, and filmed for very little money by another unit during the production of Season 2. The shorts were allegedly offered as a package to Netflix for $40 million, a sum CBS thought Netflix would agree was peanuts and fair once divided among their entire subscriber base. Alas, Netflix did not agree and laughed them out of the room. CBS then reduced the price to $35 million, then $30 million, then $25 million, then $20, then $15. Netflix still weren't interested at any price point CBS were willing to go down to. Currently, Bell Media appears to be the only foreign outlet that has agreed to pay the reduced asking price for short treks, which will appear along with Discovery on Space and Stream on Crave TV. However, it would seem that prices still weren't nearly low enough that any other international distributors were interested in shelling out what CBS asked for the shorts. Instead of bringing in tens of millions of dollars in international sales like they were intended to, the shorts only served as further confirmation to CBS that Star Trek Discovery isn't as popular around the world as they would have liked. To the board at CBS, this is a major cause for concern, and for that, there will be repercussions. On September 9th of 2018, a long and illustrious career ended when Leslie Moonves stepped down from his positions as the chairman and CEO of the CBS Corporation, and not entirely of his own free will. Moonves first joined CBS back in 1995, then as president of CBS Entertainment. Despite his dislike for Star Trek and all related properties, he did exceedingly well in this position and was promoted time and again in the years that followed. When the Me Too movement first gained momentum, Moonves was extremely supportive and described it as a watershed moment during a November 2017 press conference. He was also a founding member of the Commission on Sexual Harassment and Advancing Equality in the Workplace, which was formed in late 2017 to, quote, tackle the broad culture of abuse and power disparity, end quote. And in January of 2018, CBS released public service announcements concerning how to combat sexual harassment. There were, however, those that thought this might all have been posturing. For decades, there had been rumors about CBS head honcho Les Moonves and his ultimate boss, Viacom chief Sumner Redstone, frequently attending sex parties that would make Caligula blush and for indulging their appetites outside of such dedicated venues as well. The stories about Sumner Redstone and his sexual escapades are published and well known, but Les Moonves avoided similar public scrutiny until the summer of 2018. Then, more and more women, from interns to other executives, started coming forward with their stories of being sexually harassed and even threatened by Moonves. The oldest of these stories dated back to the 1980s and persisted until recently. This eventually led to Moonves being fired in disgrace, not just for the ever more detailed stories that were increasingly making the rounds in the news headlines, but for misleading the board and trying to cover up his transgressions instead of coming clean about them. Moonves continues to deny all allegations. Without mentioning any of his career highlights, CBS announced that Moonves had left the company and would not receive any of his exit compensation pending the results of the independent investigation into his allegations. Furthermore, the company has named six new members of its board of directors and said it would donate $20 million to the organizations that support the Me Too movement and workplace equality for women, a donation that would be deducted from any severance payments that still may be due to Moonves. 
pending the outcome of an internal investigation by CBS. If Moonves is cleared of any wrongdoing, he would be owed a severance package of $120 million. According to CNBC, it is still unclear whether that severance package would total more or less than the stated $120 million after the donation. And so, the reign of the man who greenlit and micromanaged Star Trek Discovery came to an end, although that end had nothing to do with Star Trek. That does, however, leave the question, how will the removal of Les Moonves influence Star Trek going forward? As we covered in earlier videos, Moonves didn't just greenlight Star Trek Discovery. He fired original showrunner Brian Fuller and micromanaged the series' first season himself, with Alex Kurtzman in some sense acting as his lieutenant. As such, Moonves had a vested interest in the series being a hit. With the removal of not just Moonves, but also six board members that were loyal to him, there are no executives left at CBS with any kind of vested interest in protecting Star Trek Discovery, or the general direction Star Trek has taken on CBS All Access. To be clear, everyone at CBS wants the Star Trek brand to prosper and to bring in many new subscribers to CBS All Access, but no one currently left at CBS had any direct responsibility in making Star Trek Discovery what it would become, meaning any perceived failure can be blamed on Moonves. The remaining executives have no reason to throw good money after bad. On the contrary, it is in their best interest to find out why Star Trek hasn't worked as intended for either CBS or Netflix and determine a new course of action to amend the situation. To this end, every decision Moonves ever made on Star Trek may end up under scrutiny. That includes the decision of appointing Alex Kurtzman to function as essentially the Kevin Feige of Star Trek on CBS All Access. The Star Trek universe, even on TV, is in some sense comparable to a cinematic universe, and Alex Kurtzman is no stranger to taking on cinematic universes. When Sony originally wanted to make their own Spider-Man cinematic universe back in 2013, they hired a number of prolific writers to help them do so, most notably Alex Kurtzman, who would stay on to serve as the creative brain trust alongside Matt Tolmek and Avi Arad. However, the assignment would be short-lived, as the first incarnation of Sony Spider-Man universe would crumble after the underperformance of the first movie in it, The Amazing Spider-Man 2. Next, Universal hired Kurtzman to oversee their Universal Monster Cinematic Universe, dubbed The Dark Universe. Kurtzman was also tasked with writing and directing the first movie in it, The Mummy. As it turned out, this would also be a relatively short-lived assignment, since The Mummy underperformed even worse than The Amazing Spider-Man 2 did making it both the first and last installment of Universal's Dark Universe. But through all of this, Kurtzman remained one of the Golden Boys at Paramount and Bad Robot, where he had already worked extensively on the Kelvin Timeline Star Trek movies. Through the Paramount connection, he started working on Star Trek Discovery since very early on in the series development. Reportedly, he and Moonves saw eye to eye, and together they took Discovery in a very different direction from what original showrunner Brian Fuller wanted which, as we've covered before, would lead to Fuller eventually being fired. On June 19th of 2018, Moonves gave Kurtzman the job of overseeing Star Trek on TV, or rather, on CBS All Access. This was no short-term assignment, as CBS signed him for a five-year mission, five years in which Kurtzman would decide which series would be developed and which would be given the green light. So far, two series have been greenlit under Kurtzman's watch, the Picard series, which is being fast-tracked so it can serve as a possible replacement for Star Trek Discovery if the powers that be decide to cancel it after its second season, and Star Trek Lower Decks, a half-hour animated comedy series from Rick and Morty's Mike McMahon. We will cover both of these at greater length in an upcoming video. But what remains to be seen is for how long Kurtzman will have the same kind of autonomy that he had under the Moonves regime. While the reign of Les Moonves, by and large, was an exceedingly profitable one for CBS, their share value has tanked in the last few years. Fixing that will be one of the ultimate goals of the new management, when it is in place, that is. Les Moonves served as both CEO and chairman of the board and was removed from both positions rather suddenly, with no plan of succession in place for either. Two weeks after Moonves was removed, Richard Parsons was appointed interim chairman of the board. In this capacity, he negotiated Moonves's departure, and he helped resolve a contentious legal battle between CBS and its controlling shareholder, Sherry Redstone, daughter of the aforementioned Sumner Redstone, a battle over a potential CBS Viacom remerger, which she advocated and Moonves opposed. As part of the settlement, Redstone agreed not to raise the merger issue for about two years. Parsons was also instrumental in the appointment of longtime Moonves lieutenant Joseph Agnello, 
as acting CEO. On October 22nd, however, it was announced that Parsons had resigned due to health reasons, and Strauss Zelnick, chairman and CEO of Take-Two Interactive Software, had assumed the interim chairman's role effective immediately. In other words, at the time of making this video, CBS has only an acting CEO and interim board of directors. What the future will hold for Star Trek is uncertain until those positions are permanently filled and a new strategy is known, and Star Trek will more likely than not be part of that strategy as CBS are heavily invested in CBS All Access and Star Trek is vital to CBS All Access. How Star Trek is handled should be important to any future CEO and chairman of CBS. For the time being, Kurtzman will continue to serve in the role he was appointed to by Moonves, but if he is allowed to continue in that role, he will have to show the future permanent CEO and chairman of the board far better results than Discovery has delivered so far. In two years, Sherry Redstone will resume the fights to have CBS and Viacom remerged. Without Moonves opposing her, and with the six Moonves loyalist CBS board members that were ousted alongside Moonves being replaced by Sherry Redstone loyalists, she just might get her way. The full significance of that we will cover in our upcoming video dealing with the Star Trek rights issues. Till then, let us know your thoughts on the shorts, the firing of Les Moonves, and how excited you are for Season 2 of Discovery in the comments. If you like this video, then please click the subscribe button. And don't forget to click the bell icon to be notified for all the latest uploaded content. Due to recent changes to YouTube's monetization policies, we'd also like to ask you to please consider supporting Midnight's Edge and its sister channel Midnight's Edge After Dark through Patreon. As thanks for their support, patrons will receive early notifications of mini documentaries, special behind the scenes making of the Edge videos, bloopers, outtakes, lost episodes, and more. You can support the channel for as little as $1 a month. Be sure to check back for news and analysis on the corporate politics behind your favorite genre movies, as well as updates and discussion here at Midnight's Edge.